Oh, it's okay. I want to start with conspiracies. Yeah. I love this topic. Let's start. <laughs> so, uh, and I have a bunch of ways to get into it. By the way, conspiracy number one, not really conspiracy, but coincidence, January 22nd is my birthday as well. So not that, that means Wild. anything. Wild. <laughs> not that it means anything. Interesting. It's like, what is- It might. We, we it were just certainly talking, might. Well, we were just talking about Kurt Vonnegut. What does he call that in Cat's Cradle where people have this false- uh, way of identifying themselves with each other. I, like everybody from Indiana was part of a- Yeah, I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, but anyway, I was once on a news show and uh, I, I've been a pundit on a lot of different news shows. And a the producer tells me afterwards, he's like, man, we're just trying to get from one ad break to the next. Like that's the entire right. purpose of news. Right. And it made me- think this is like 10 years ago, but it made me think ever since, and I've literally never watched a news show since, or even picked up a newspaper that all news and all history, they always say history is written by the, the winners, winners yeah. but I don't even think that's true. I think it's written by the 1% of the winner winners who have a very specific agenda. So that's enough to get their narrative of the events, uh, uh, on top of all the other news who have different, you know, perspectives. And, and like a classic, almost cliched example is World War II. So of course, America wins World War II and you read about it in, in school books when you're a kid, but you don't read about the, the dozens of weird atrocities that, right. you know, that America did or other countries did. You know, of course you read about the extreme atrocities the Germans did, which is important, but, you know, you don't re realize how America might have you know, false flagged its way into the war or or how America turned back the Jews who were trying to escape to America and just, you know, or how we, you know. You don't read anything about building the Third Reich, which our, our financial system, you know, was instrumental in, you know. Yeah, and not only that, the, yeah. our financial system, the quote unquote neutral Swiss right. lent $12 billion to right. Germany. Yeah. Like, well, I think a lot of these things are, there's a reason, right? So there's a reason we don't learn about these things. I think that, um, when you look at history and you go like there was almost a coup in the U.S., uh, there was a General Smedley Butler. Smedley Butler during FDR, they were going. There was a bunch of wealthy industrialists that backed the idea of Smedley Butler marching on Washington, kind of demanding FDR's resignation. They thought that the New Deal was straight communism. They thought that the government had been, you know, completely infiltrated, and that they needed to defend their, you know, class, so to speak, or whatever. And it was a lot of wealthy industrialists. It was a lot of people whose names you might know. It was a lot of very influential families. And, you know, this is this is all verifiable. You can look it up. You can read about it. Um, you know, I'm I'm maybe downplaying it when you actually do read about it. You go, oh, my God. Like, the, this was real history. I went through school. I did not hear one thing about this happening. Not one. So then you go, well, why? Why aren't you being told that? And you wonder, you're like, well, it certainly sets up the Kennedy assassination in a very different light. If you did right, learn about Joseph it. Joseph Kennedy was one of those industrialists. Very, his father. Yeah. So it does set that up in a very different light. Like the idea that like, well, well, the idea that maybe this, this president was taken out by, you know, a group of people that was a little closer to home. There doesn't seem to be any precedent for unless not in America, like all over the world, we have coups, we have, you know, all kinds of, we're, we're all kinds of skullduggery that the, you know, the CIA and other people have been involved in, but there's no domestic precedent for that. Unless you read about Smedley Butler, then you start going, wow. So this actually was something that people considered. So I think whenever we're not hearing about something, there's probably a reason. Yeah. So in, you know, take, you know, your uh, favorite current example, Jeffrey Epstein. Sure. Suddenly he was in the news every day, every day, every day, suicide. Then the next week he's in the news every day, every day, every day. Then suddenly two guards are, are indicted for criminal conspiracy. I mean, what's the conspiracy? Who I means someone else was involved right. and you never hear about it in the news again. Yeah. Yeah. And like, why is it like, there's a reporter here. Well, for one thing, I think there are no more actual reporters breaking news, but Very even, few. but even assuming there was, do, do the editors say, no, 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 we can't write that. I think what happens is I, I don't think it's as top down as that from the people that I've spoken to uh, and the people that I've had on my show. A lot of it is just that 
these news organizations depend on access to get a story, right? They depend on a White House press pass. They depend on leaks from an administration, not only the White House, but, you know, it could be the mayor's office, whatever. They want to scoop. They want to scoop everybody else. This is what essentially news is, being being first to get the story. Now, if you write things that are either overly critical of uh, a certain uh, person or administration, if you write things that are easily painted as conspiratorial, if you write things that are, you know, if you really rock the boat, you begin to lose access to these people who your very livelihood depends on. You depend on these people to leak stories so that you could, otherwise you're just chasing, uh, you know, four or five other news organizations that have already broken the story and you don't want that. So I think that what happens is you go, well, we're not going to write about Prince Andrew because we want to interview Will and Kate. Right. So there's the right. hot mic at ABC. They, right. You know, what, what happened to that anger? Did she get in trouble or anything or did she just apologize? Well, the girl who leaked the video was fired. The right. girl who took was the that video the actual I think girl? was fired. I think there was some question like they fired the wrong girl. Very possibly. I don't know. But I know that the ABC anchor came out and basically said, you know, she did a whole big mea culpa. I'm sorry. Da, da, da. It was a private moment. And uh, which was always interesting to me because she's saying things that make sense. Yeah. So whenever somebody apologizes for things that make sense, I go, why are you doing that? Why are you apologizing for things that make sense? And I think the reality is that, you know, her job, it just depends on the right people liking her. Right. So just just to summarize that one, um, you know, the whole Epstein thing happened. And then James O'Keefe from the Veritas. Right. Project Morgan, Veritas, yeah. Yeah. He uh, uh, someone gave him this hot mic. She was talking to a hot mic where she says she had the whole Epstein story three years earlier. But somebody from above and she worked at ABC, somebody from above basically said, if you you can't do this, otherwise we won't get. Uh, the royal family, Prince William, Kate, the whole thing, and yeah. she had, she had to squash the story, and she was complaining about it, and then she didn't get in trouble. But if if I were her, I probably would have leaned into it. Like, damn right, I said that because then she could have pulled more of like a Megyn Kelly and gotten a much more higher paying job somewhere else. Yeah, potentially, you know, I mean, potentially, I think that all of these news organizations. What, where, where, whatever side they appear to be on politically are all about loyalty, right? So you'd wonder if another news organization, even though she might be the hot thing of the moment, you know, is she going to do that to us? Yeah. I think that's the big question. You know, if somebody's going to hire her, they go, is she going to do that to us? Because they all, all of these organizations want to control proprietary information and they all don't want anybody, they all don't want people running around uh, you know, telling tales out of school and saying, well, they, we had this story, we had that, we were pressured, you know. I think these pressures exist in a pretty uniform way across all these uh, institutions. You know, and it's very blatant. Like, I'll tell you a simple example. One time, this is like 2007, maybe, I was writing for the business section of the New York Post. And I, tr so the Dow Jones Industrial Index started in like the 1890s. That's the main way people measure the stock market. And the original companies, the only one that still exists is General Electric. And I sort of traced the history of the other companies in the original index. And they essentially had all had gone either bankrupt or disappeared in some way or right. other. So I wrote this article about it, which was kind of interesting historically. And it shows how, you know, sometimes the you know, indices in the market might not be, mean the same thing. And the New York Post said, ah, no, we don't think this article is interesting enough. Uh, we can't run it. And that's the only time out of like 100 articles that they had ever said no to. Well, it turns out the Dow Jones Index is owned by Fox, which owns the New York Post. So sometimes it's very yeah. like, blatant what happens. Pretty blatant. Pretty blatant. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I just go, I've noticed that in every news organization I've been involved in, which is another reason why you just nothing Nothing at the top layer is accurate. Nothing even at the second layer, like interpreting the top layer is accurate. Like you, so, so there's no way unless you know people to get the accurate news of what's happening right now. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that the challenge now is if you want to be informed, you have to read a wide range of information. You have to, because you have to cross-reference things. You have to see something here and go, okay, is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Who said it? Why? I mean, it's there's a lot more work you have to do now if you want to be informed. But, you know, the happiest people I know are not informed. <laughs> so the happiest people I know are, you know, Long Island gym teachers who don't care and go on, you know. 
two vacations a year and don't have a ton of money and don't want it and don't, you know happiness and knowledge i mean it's just this complete this i think you know ignorance is to an extent bliss i mean if you find out the way the world works i don't know that you're going to be happier or better for it except unless yeah. you view it as fun because like yeah, if, I, if I mean, you view I it as make like it funny right that's yeah and i'm sure you do too like our job to me my job is to make dark things you know, a little better by by being funny in the world out there. But I, I mean, there's things I know that I wish I didn't know and that other Why? people don't. Well, because, you know, for example, I mean, maybe wish I didn't know is the wrong word. But like th when you're on the outside, there's only two places you can be the inside or the outside. When you're on the outside, you know, you appreciate things in a, in a different way. You know, before I got into comedy, I appreciated it as kind of like magic. It was like this magic thing that I could just sit back and enjoy. And I didn't know what went into it. And I didn't know the pain and the, I didn't know like how, how dark it was and how many people fail at it and how many lives get ruined. I didn't know, you know, you know, all of the things that went into it that make it harder to kind of appreciate. Then I got into it and I'm on the inside of it. And I also didn't know how vapid some of it was and, how boring, uh, you know, people talk about Hollywood as it's this dark and evil place. A lot of that's true, but a lot of it is also boring. You know, it's just kind of vapid and, you know, you, you, you would be surprised at how, uh, you know, how kind of, you know, you meet a lot of these people and, and, and some of them are just very lucky. Some of them are, are, are not spectacular in any meaningful way. They were just good looking. They, they worked hard. Many of them are just sociopaths that don't feel anything. And that's such an asset. Such an asset to not feel anything, you right, know, to pretend to be yeah, something or else, or to make yourself into someone who you know doesn't feel anything. But you can't, you know, in these interviews, you no, no celebrity admits that. No celebrity admits like I wanted this more than my family and friends and any uh, meaningful relationship, and I just literally uh, killed everything inside of me that felt, and I needed to do that to to. Be they don't say that. They're like, I'm concerned about the climate, you know. Because they have to present, because that would ruin it, right? It would ruin it if your favorite actor or actress got on Good Morning America and was like, I was beaten every day by my alcoholic mother and told I wasn't good enough, and that's why I'm here. You couldn't have that. So you have to have somebody be, you know, invent this narrative that may or may not exist. And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So when you're on the inside, you realize all that stuff, and it, and it, it lessens some of it. I guess in, in some ways it makes it more interesting. To me, it always makes it more interesting. But I don't appreciate it nearly as much as my my friends that are just completely in that. Now, obviously, now I can you can never go back. You right. can never would go you, back. If you knew this at the age of 25, would you still have, would you have changed direction? Would you have not gone? No, I would have gone. I would have ca I would have ex done exactly what I did. Yeah. So, I mean, saying that I wish I didn't know it's a little di uh, different, but like. It certainly changes the way you look at things. Well, you know, and you use the word narrative. And I, I think what's what's happened for me is that I can't look at anything as the straight story. I'm always trying right. to figure out, OK, this is this person's narrative. Now, what's four layers deeper? Why do they have this narrative? Right. And then and then why did they choose this narrative over others? This is why you can't Republican or Democrat, you can't just look at them and say, oh, he stands for this. He's a good person or she stands for this. She's a good person because it's all a narrative based on polling and and, you know, tests yeah. they've done in front of others. And you yeah. just don't know anything like when Mayor Pete has a smile. Is he smiling? Is it a legitimate smile or was he told this is How the moment? Scary is Mayor Pete. You know, what's interesting about Mayor Pete? Somebody somebody told me this. I, I found this very interesting. They said this was a very elite, well placed person in a very wealthy family. And they said that Mayor Pete, they were like the scariest guys in the world are the Mayor Pete's of the world. And I said, what do you mean by that? They said people without family money and without connections, but want it more than anything. They said people without that, without the family and the connections, but want it, will, uh, will do anything. He goes, those are, their, those are the truly terrifying human beings. Their ambition is unrivaled and they don't have any, any fallback. You know, there's nothing that... There's no comfort that surrounds them. So their ability to to navigate the world and their ability to advance themselves is all based on, you know, just kind of this ruthlessness and this idea that they'll kind of tell anybody anything. It's just a fascinating type of person. And 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 that person is is kind of terrifying. Yeah, because I oh, I just asked someone yesterday who said that they were for 
Mayor Pete. And by the way, I have no opinion. I kind sure. of, I sort of view this as a game because again, I don't know what the real right. narratives of anyone well, are. But you figured it out because you're living here. Like you get it. So here's the thing, and this is what most people can't admit. There's going to be a small group of people that get it. They get that it's a game. You're one of the people that get it. And then you do very well. But then there are the people that don't get it and won't get it and are like, did you hear what Elizabeth Warren said? And it's like, God, it doesn't matter. But they don't, it, it's, it will never, and that's why you have a lot of people whose entire life, like I was, you know, I go to family over the holidays and everybody's up in arms about what they, you didn't know who Elizabeth Warren was six months ago. And now she's either your God or the worst person you've ever met or, or you've ever seen. And it's like, isn't that interesting that your entire experience on earth is being programmed like a net, like a TV network. You're here are the stars you're going to talk about here are the, here are their storylines and you're going to react to it exactly the way we knew you would. Um, and that's why people get stuck in these dead end jobs and relationships and things they don't like to do. Um, and, and, and you get it. Like people get it. it. Certain people just look at it and go, you know, Steve Wozniak once was like, yeah, it doesn't really truly matter. He was like, presidents can do things, but I, I just think it's, it's a money game kind of. And whoever ends up like, you know, as the candidates, it's kind of like whoever has more money. And this guy's a genius. I mean, you know, so when you listen to people like yourself who are incredibly intelligent go, it's a game, more people should listen. And they don't. It's amazing that they don't because right. they think you're wrong. Like, right. imagine that. It's fascinating to me. Well, it is because it, it, it has to be a game. And then you have to yeah. understand what the rules are. So you could, you, you have to come, you, you can't possibly determine who's going to be the better president, but you have to at least understand what the rules are so you know how it's going to affect you. Right. Kind of nothing else matters because right. everyone will say, oh, climate change. We don't really know. And there's nothing right. we've ever done that has ever worked really. So, right. so, so, and I'm not even, I'm not saying pro this or against this. I'm again saying if someone's saying something very specific about some issue, uh, and I use that as an example, you always have to figure out what's the agenda, what's the money behind that issue, you know, what, what, who is this person gaining like I favor love one with? One of my uncles was like, he went into this whole thing about Elizabeth Warren claiming to be a Native American. And I'm like, who can't list? They're gonna, they all lie about everything. Right. Like, don't you get that yet? Yes, she's, yes, she's not a Native American. This was fake. They lie about war. They lie about peace. Everything's a lie. Have you not gotten that yet? And it's like, well, this lie offended me more than that lie. It's like, it, wait. It's children. It's like children in a schoolyard where you have to say it. But it's it's one of the reasons the country is becoming ungovernable is because the people are at too dumb to be governed. They're too dumb to like truly have a government and hold that government accountable there. It's children. You have infants running around. You have toddlers. You have to put gates up around the house. You have to say no candy for breakfast. Like it, it's just a problem. And, you know, and that's why people say, oh, I'm, you're cynical and you're black-pilled or whatever. I'm just like, no, I go out and I meet people and I talk to them and I'm filled with fear after I meet people. I'm filled with fear. I don't understand people that aren't. I cocoon in a, a hotel bed at night after I've met people. And I go, these are the people that are supposed to check the Epstein's of the world? God help us. God help us. I mean, you have no hope. There's no hope. Right, because like take Epstein again. Why this for is a holiday episode? <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> I don't know what you want to hear, but because like take take yeah. FC this example again. The guy was convicted of pedophilia in what 2007. Yeah, he was sentenced for less months in jail than his butler, who supposedly obstructed justice by not giving evidence about him. And then for 12 years, everything was fine. Like everyone's flying around in his plane. Yeah. And then suddenly he's in the news again. Like this is a bad guy. We kind of knew 12 years ago he was a bad guy. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but again, it's like it's and now it's all political. Like and I feed into it, too, because I tweet the Clintons are scumbags. But like everybody's like, yeah, the Clintons. I'm like, they're two people in a sea of of nefarious characters. I, it's now everyone's using it's just a political battering ram and it's a meme and it's a joke and I mean it's like and, and I get it I make jokes about it too I there's just this idea that we've we've all woken up to the idea that there's really no way out and I don't mean no way out in the sense that you can't have a good life and you can't do productive meaningful things 
but no way out in the sense that like it, it just, you know, in general with these 350 million people in this country, it, you know, we've got, we've got AI coming. We've got automation coming. We've got climate problems coming. We've got a tremendous wealth disparity. We have a tremendously powerful corporate state, which involves the government, the military, major corporation. You know, we're extended as an empire all over the world. We have a political class that's, you know, been blackmailed or whatever. They're, they're completely ineffective. The government's somewhat broken. You know, even the horrible Trump's policies are pretty much the same as everybody else's. It's this stagnation that's been happening for a while. And then people are just, you know, I, I, you call all of that out and you go like, the problems are so deep and it requires, you know, so much to get out of any one of them. You, you, you just have to enjoy where we are right now and laugh and enjoy it and do what you can and be good to the people that you can and take on the causes that are meaningful to you. But the ship is heading towards the iceberg. We all see the iceberg and we can't really do anything. I think that's really the knowledge of that is kind of freeing to some people or some people it's like really bleak, which is why we have the opioid crisis and everything else. It's like people just can't handle the idea that like there's the iceberg. We see the iceberg and we're making jokes about it. We're memeing the iceberg. So instead of being like, help, no, move, we're like, LOL, iceberg, here's me, here's me on the way to the iceberg, heading to the berg, you know, gonna drown soon in the li lifeboats, like, who's gonna be first in the lifeboat? Hope it's a trans person of color, but, like, it's done, you know? It's been a good run, it's been fun. But that's kind of- It's been you know, fun. Depending on your perspective. For me, it's, it's been worse for other people, I- and I, that sucks. I didn't. I don't want that. But but I think the it's been fun is is a perspective. Like you said earlier, yeah. you have to ask why. And I think that's your special technique that you've honed, yeah. which is you look at any situation and you're able to kind of ask why and turn it upside down and then connect the dots backwards. So you're able to like sometimes I'll see you say something. Let's say on the Joe Rogan podcast, and yeah. I'm like, man, that doesn't make sense at all. Right. And and yet. And then you'll connect the dots backwards and I'll be thinking to myself, he just took that and now it makes complete sense. Like well, there's a logic to it. It's, I still might not agree, the, but it makes logic. The greatest way to, to not have a career is to make sense, <laughs> by the way. And this is my advice to anyone right now. Uh, if the greatest way in this climate to not have a career and to be irrelevant is to make rational sense. Uh, look at the world we're living in, dummy. And if you're still trying to be rational now, you're crazy. You're the crazy one. Yeah. Trump is the president. You know, the girl who told her mother, can I curse or no? Yeah, yeah, of course. The girl who told her mother to go fuck herself on Dr. Phil and threaten the audience is one of our leading recording artists. I mean, what does this look like in 50 years? I, good luck, folks. Rational. It's like, I have friends like that that like, you know, I know guys that write these very studious, uh, you know, cerebral pieces and they're, they're deeply contemplative people and I respect them, but I'm like, God, I don't know what you're, you know, it's like going into a Chuck E. Cheese with broccoli and going, no, the pizza's not good for you, kids. And everybody's like, there's a giant rat running around. We don't care about the nutrition. There's a rat running around. There's a ball pit. We're going in ball and you're like, you should have broccoli. It's good. It's it fights cancer. And they're like, there is no cancer. And everything's cancer. There's a giant rat. There's a ball pit. So I think that's, you know, to be funny, I reserve the right to not make sense. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, but <laughs> at the same time, you're bringing out things that have plausibility. So yeah. like, you know, you'll take these situations, you know, uh, Epstein, and you'll just wonder what are all the possibilities? I, I bring up Epstein as an example just because that's like, such a class it's almost a cliche of a conspiracy like it's yeah. almost so conspiracy like they threw that up there yes. to give people something to do <laughs> it you know it's a it's a tom clancy novel it's john grisham novel it's any of the novels it's like a rich guy and an island and the president and the lolita express and the planes and everybody's di it's royalty. like royalty and celebrity i mean it's every it just gives you a snapshot of a world that you know very little about I think that's the gr the great thing about the Epstein thing is that it gives you a snapshot of this world that you don't really know that much about. You go, how in the hell 
does a guy that was been convicted of 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 assaulting, sexually assaulting, molesting, whatever, a fourteen year old girl, have these connections? How is he this powerful? How is he able to not go to jail? Uh, you know, a, a a young poor black or Latino person who was smoking weed twenty blocks away five years ago, maybe a year ago. I don't even know what you know would have been sent to jail for longer than that guy did for assaulting and, and ruining someone's life. So you go, what the hell is going on? Why does he know presidents? And why does he know scientists? And what? And, and then you start, and that's the big rabbit hole. And the big rabbit hole is just the question why, right? It begins with why. There was a guy I had on my podcast, Russ Baker. He wrote a book about the Bush family, family of secrets. Very interesting about that family. But and it's not only about them, but, you know, basically he goes, the whole question started with why. Why is this guy the president? And then he started digging into the family and he goes, well, he's the president because his father was president. He goes, well, why was his father president? You go, well, because he was vice president. Well, why was he vice president? Well, then why? Because he was the ambassador to China. Well, why the hell was he ambassador to China? Because he ran the CIA. And that's when he stopped. He goes, why the hell did he run the CIA? And then he started digging and looking and everything. So I think a lot of this, it is the it is just that big question is why? And then you have to set on your journey. And then you start to realize that a lot of what you've been told about the way things work is not true. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you look at, like, like take the example of Bush and W. So we all know, or the, the, the theory is in the early 90s, I forget what year, he was a, a VP or an executive at this oil company, Harkin Oil. And, you know, Bush, the father, always said, make your first millions before you run for office. A decent piece of advice yeah. for politicians. And and so Harkin Oil was going down the drain. W was knew about it and allegedly illegally sold all his shares, like a several million dollars worth. Uh, and that's how he made his first millions. Then somehow he bought the Texas Rangers with just a few million and made another 10, 20, whatever out of that. And now he's got the money to run for governor. Yeah. So one time I'm, I was going to this party at this investment bank and the 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 two the chairman and vice chairman of this small investment bank um were, they're all partying they're they're sitting next to each other they're laughing the chairman was the guy um i think his name was alan quasha who was the head of harkin oil who was w's bush who let him sell those shares so he's at sitting next to terry mcauliffe who was clinton's chief fundraiser and it, this was this was a time when no Clinton was in office, so there he was. Terry McAuliffe wasn't governor of Virginia yet, and he was taking a break. But him and Alan Quasha, who were on total opposite ends of the political game, but in the financial game, they were actually working together. So it's just like everybody's right. back slapping, high fiving. Yeah. It's Christmas party, and that's the thing. Also, I think people don't get is that what you see on the outside has absolutely 0% what's going on in the inside. None of these and people the ruling, hate each if other. If the ruling class took care of people, I I think we none like I I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not a marxist. I don't believe in that. I don't think that I believe hierarchies are are there. I believe that there's going to have a society with classes. It's all going to happen. You just can't completely take all the money, all the spoils and then rig the system in perpetuity for yourselves and your friends and neighbors. You have to have some concern for people below you. And I think the problem is that we've seen over the last 50 years, we've seen these wealth concentrations and with them political concentrations of power. And I mean, one of the reasons that Trump is in office is because what it was going to be Bush v. Clinton again. And we were like, what the hell? I mean, they were already arranging the election as these two families that I, since I've been alive, I was born in 85, since I've been alive, it's been a Bush or a Clinton pretty much in the White House other than Obama. So the idea that we were going to go right back to that, it, it was just no surer sign that the country was truly in, 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 in practice an oligarchy. And, and that became so disturbing to people that they're like, we're going to throw a bomb at the system. And the bomb was Donald Trump. But yeah, behind closed doors, nope, everybody likes each other. The Clintons, the Bushes, they all hang out. And... <clears throat> The the reality was that's I think where Trump came from. That's where the outsider comes from. This idea that like we want so then so then you put somebody in who is a vulgarian, who's grotesque, who doesn't follow society's rules, who says whatever he wants, who's uh, vindictive and cruel, and 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 all of these things that you know a lot of dictators are, a lot of leaders, authoritarian leaders are. Uh, they're petty. 
they're narcissistic, and you elect somebody like that because even with all of those negative qualities, they still now Trump financially is not an outsider. We know that, but he's still appearance. He appears to be an outsider, and he is an outsider in the sense that he's not part of polite society. He's not part of that tightly scripted what we just talked about. Here's the way things are going to work, and here's the rationale we're giving you, and we're going to give it to you in this very careful carefully constructed way you have a guy who's a bull in a china shop and the china shop is why we needed the bull like and that's what people don't realize you might hate trump you might not like him you might think he's great but he he he's necessitated by the the idea that we've just had the same group of people recycling the same ideas uh that really haven't worked and all we've seen is an erosion of people's you know not only their rights but you know, their, 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 their money, their status in society, their station in society. And I mean, listen, I perform all over the country. It's, it's not great out there. There's a lot of problems. You go to Ohio, you go to Rust Belt, you go to, you know, you go to these places where, you know, the, you know, these people, you know, as George Carlin said, a system that threw them overboard 30 years ago, there, there's not much to do. I mean, the factories are gone. Uh, you know, the schools are underfunded. There's a massive opioid crisis. Like, People are upset and I think there's rage and the rage is directed at those, you know, people that are back slapping and hanging out at the Christmas party. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And I think I don't know if there's a solution necessarily, because right. like you said, it's tough. So, so in 2016, what do you think about Yang? Does Yang make sense? You, so, you know, more about finance than than anyone that I come into contact with in my daily life. Does Yang make any sense or is he every now and then he says something I like, but then I see him on a skateboard and I go, <laughs> you know, well, that's just it. Like, yes, I like Yang. Um, and I thought this is going to be the guy like he felt smart. He, he, it felt like he also asks, why is this happening? He felt like he was sort of one of us a little bit. And um, and, you know, then I even was like, he, he, I was texting him and he would text back. And so I thought, OK, he's. He, and I, I, I have his books here somewhere, and uh, he, he was making sense in that way. And then um, there were two things that bothered me where I started to feel like, damn, he's got a weird narrative now also. Because I, I like the UBI, the idea of... Is it as bad as he says what's coming? No. I don't know. It's, okay. It's not as bad as he says. Okay. And that, that was the first problem. But, but the solution I like. I like the idea that use a, a progressive, not regressive, but a progressive sales tax essentially to pay for a thousand dollars a month for everybody. Uh, uh, people can opt out of different social programs to get the UBI and so on. He had the math to, and the UBI makes sense. What I don't like is uh, his, the fear mongering. So he says automation right. is going to take all the truckers jobs. The truckers are going to rebel in the streets and then automation is going to take everyone else's jobs. And this time things are different. And it's like a little bit of fear mongering. Like everyone's scared now. Like, oh my gosh, uh, automation is going to take everyone's jobs. And, but you look at it like truck drivers right now, they, there's job postings, but they, they need 30% more truck drivers than there already are. They're so like, people are just buying so much stuff from Amazon. We need more, the country needs more yeah. truck drivers. So you can have 30% of, of that taken by automation. It won't affect employment at all and then you do look at you know then you can't have automation driving you can drive on the highway but you can't have them drive in the city streets there's too many things that they can't recognize so they'll get accidents so you, then you'll need you'll if you if you automate all the trucks on the highways there's going to be many more trucks then you're going to need many more trucks in the city delivering to the last mile so the truck drivers have a buffer there will be a job they can move to and this you can say this for every industry like ATM machines, everybody thought that was the end of bank tellers, but it turned out the banks started making so much profit, they put a chase branch on every corner and there's more tellers hired than ever. So I think Yang should know better. So I don't know. So I ask why, why is he saying this when he comes out of this world? He should know better. Everyone in technology knows better. And I think he's just doing that to scare people for his UBI, his justification for the, which I agree with. I agree. He should, should have just started with the UBI and forgotten the fear mongering. And then the other thing that disturbed me was he always says after every debate, uh, they didn't let me speak. They didn't let me speak. They didn't let me right. speak. 
uh, in their last debate trending, uh, let Yang speak. But you know what? Fucking raise your hand like or interrupt right. like everyone else does. Like you could yeah. speak. You, there was one question they asked Bernie Sanders. Well, how are you going to pay for uh, forgiving all student loan debt? And I knew Yang uh, has a great answer for this. He said it on Joe Rogan, actually, the answer for that. He could have just raised his hand or interrupted like every single other candidate does. You want a candidate who can stand up to like North Korea and China and Russia and he can't raise his hand. He's like intimidated by Bernie Sanders, which is the right. weirdest thing in the world. So those two things disturb me. And so interesting. I find because yeah. I, I was kind of like, I, I don't know. You know, so from the outside, I go, it does seem that automation and artificial intelligence going forward will be a problem eventually. To it, a degree. It could be, but it's also yeah. going to create, like, yeah, it'd be good if radiologists are replaced by AI who could see cancer on your x-rays, then more people will live longer and there'll be more opportunities to create drugs. And it's not like opportunities are going to go away as the world gets better. So is it, do we need a higher skilled worker though? Is that a problem? Because when you go around America and you meet people, you go, I'm trying to imagine the job they'll do when I draw a blank sometimes. Yeah. When I talk to somebody, I go, I wonder what job they would do. And then you go, this is a person who does need a low skilled job because there's a lot of people that are just not educated. What do you do with those people? Because there's a lot of them. There, there is a lot of them. And I mean, I don't know all the answers, but it's not going to be worse than it is now. Okay. Italy, Interesting. It, it, this, is, this is, this is very positive. Yeah, because it's 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 you're still going to be solving major problems with automation. And then when major problems are solved, new industries start. That's happened every single time in the past 300 years of, of capitalism. So I'm not saying, oh, just be pro-capitalist and it'll all work out. Because like you said, the role of government is to take care of people who can't take care of themselves or who are weaker in some way. And there's always going to be some role for that. But... It's not it's like robots aren't going to suddenly wake up and and, you know, take everyone's jobs. So then I ask why. Why did Elon Musk, who, by the way, creates more automation than anyone else? Why is he support Yang? So he must there's a, some narrative. It's you asking why. Like there's some narrative here that we don't quite understand. And and I don't understand it. Like what's Yang's role in this? I don't I don't really understand. But things are certainly not going to be worse with automation. They never have been. They've always created industries that we can't even imagine now. And just the basic things that Andrew worries about are not worries because he doesn't address the fact that we actually need more truck drivers in the country. And if you if automation takes away the highway truck drivers, we're going to need more city truck drivers. Right. So the jobs are just going to move over. So his basic argument doesn't work. Although, like I said, I love the solution. I think UBI is a better solution than forgiving student loan debt, which only, which as Andrew Yang says, only benefits the top one third of society, you know, and, and the other two thirds, you're using the money from the other two thirds. So I don't know. I, I just got disappointed in Andrew not raising his hand to that, to that question. Like what, why is yeah. he then spread the narrative? Oh, they don't let me speak when he could, and the rules are, he could just raise his hand. He could just interrupt. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens. You know, I think that, that it's, he's tapping into a real fear. Yeah. And I think he's tapping into the, the idea that a lot of people that are in low skilled, low paying jobs right now are struggling and they're terrified if those jobs go away, which right. is understandable. Right. Well, that's the narrative Trump had, except instead yeah. of narr except it instead of immigrants automation, coming yeah. instead of robots. Yeah. I think it's both. I think that like the idea is that like, if you have, if you, I totally get people being afraid of both things in the sense that more low skilled workers depress will depress wages. That's why the Koch brothers loved open borders. They loved the idea of it because it was just supplied right. a lot of their you know industries with with low wage labor. And I understand people going, well, what the hell is going to happen if this job is done by a robot? So like. I think that fear is rational, even though it can be demagogued by people like Trump and it can become very ugly and it can become this kind of strain of nationalism that you don't want. But I think fear in and of itself is somewhat rational. Uh, and, and the idea that you should like be concerned with what you're going to be doing in five years or 10 years is 
I, is, you know. I agree. It's scary. Like, I always wonder, and I, I wonder if you think about this when you see all the people traveling around. I always wonder, where is this person going to be when he's 70 years old? Right. So, because we're going to live to be 70. Like, lifespan's yeah. increasing. Like, where... Where are these people going to be? Like they're not going to be doing they can't they're not going to be able to be doing the same job or the job's right. going to be gone or whatever. Just what's going to happen to everybody? I mean, it's going to be interesting. I mean, the people that are in their 40s, 50s now that that I mean, it's very tough to go out there and find something. I mean, it is very hard, which is why the Yang or somebody that recognizes the scope of the prophecy, I think that what makes Yang interesting as opposed to these other people is that even though, like you said, he's maybe dramatizing the the uh, you know the the effects of automation for his own personal gain? This he talks with very big ideas. Yeah, he's super the, smart. He's at the, the highest IQ right, of all of them. The scope of the problems that we face are big, and when we see politicians talk about them, they make them very small because in in order to make them seem surmountable, these obstacles, you make them small. Go well. I on my first day, I'll commission a panel. I mean, we can. I did it the other day on my podcast. I I said like, ask me any question, and I can just answer it by saying, on my first day, I'm gonna get the smartest people, put them in a room, we're gonna get a panel, I'm gonna listen to people. I've I've been to the border, I've seen, and it's just like a formula of what they say, and none of it means anything. It's just right. word salad. It's just like smartest people, first day. I've been there. I've been all over the country talking to people just like you, their concerns are the same. So on day one, I'm going to commission a panel of people. We're going to raise taxes. We're going to, you know, everything's just the same thing over and over again. So you have a Yang or somebody who comes in and goes, no, the robots are going to eat us and you all get $1,000. You go, oh, okay. Well, that's different. Right, it's, it's just different. craving that difference, which is where Trump came from. I think I Trump's think like, no, nope, we're all liars. We're cheaters. We're liars. I'm the biggest liar and cheater, and now I'm going to help you. And everyone went, oh, well, well, that's nice. Well, think about it. Everybody has been different, right? So so Trump was very different. Of course, Barack Obama was very different. Very different. Um, in, he, in appearance. Yeah. Not in anything else. Right. No, I mean, he, he was a good, I think he was a decent president, a good president for what he had to contend with. But, you know, what was very interesting about Obama was he was pretty much business as usual. And Trump's kind of business as usual, Yeah, too. we're still in Afghanistan. We're still yeah, in Iraq. Yeah, we'll like, be there. And they don't even explain why we're there anymore. E even W was different because people were sick of Clinton and Gore. Sure. Gore was just going to be a continuation of that. Yeah. And then Reagan was different from Carter. Carter was different from Nixon Ford. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think difference wins, not just in politics, but in career. Like, look at comedy. Who wins in comedy? You have... You know, Louis C.K. was obviously very different. He was he, he was he was making a new special every year. It was kind of like started that whole trend of we've got to write and rewrite and take every topic under the sun and make a new special every year. Uh, you know, you're very different with your you know, you have this like kind of such a strong point of view. Again, I said it before, but yeah. you're you're not you're kind of like taking what everybody's thinking and twisting it into something funny, like a, like a pretzel that looks funny now, as yeah, opposed yeah, to like yeah. just this. And, and I don't know what comedian is just the standard thing. And then he just rises up and, and becomes yeah. successful. I can't think of anybody who's just like, Oh yeah, let's just follow so the line. Wh what do you think it is? What, because it's interesting because I criticize a lot of like what I consider to be hucksters. They peddle this idea that everybody just has to hustle and grind and go out and do this and that. And the other thing, because I think that at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people are just not built to have their own business. That's just the reality. It doesn't mean that they're bad people, but there's just a lot of people that are not. So to tell everyone they should be their own boss or that there's a business inside of everyone or any of those things, I don't think are true. However, I do think that people should try to do what they, but how do you reconcile the idea of people having a nature and some people's nature is to be a leader. Some people's nature is to be a follower. It's not a judgment on them as a person. I know there's a lot of bad leaders and a lot of good followers. And, and I don't even mean in their private life. I'm just talking about the way that it all shakes out in the world. Um, you know, I do videos about Gary Vee and stuff that are kind of funny, poking fun at him. I don't think he's the worst guy in the world. But like that whole ethos of telling my whole generation of people and the people under me that they all need to have their own company. It doesn't matter if they don't know uh, what or, you know, like one of my favorite quotes from Gary is he goes, ideas are shit. It's all about execution. It's like, well, then what, what are we doing? 
right. what are we executing? Right. So to me, it's like that's the big fake out of the whole thing. It's like ideas are shit. Doesn't matter. Just execute. And it's like execute what? Right. Or execute how? Right. Because you need ideas on execution. Like right. there's bad execution and there's good execution. Right. Like I've seen plenty of businesses fail because they took the hard way to execute something as opposed to a much easier way just because they didn't have practice coming up with ideas. You have to be good at coming up with ideas to know how to execute something. But let me ask you, why do you think someone like Gary or other kind of business self-help gurus that appeal to a certain audience, why do you think they're saying that? Well, I don't know. I think that they're making, this is how that they, uh, this is their business, right? Their business, they're selling an idea. And the idea is that people are going to be self-sufficient and successful and happy if they follow this 10 point plan or if they do X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, I just find a lot of it to be hollow because people ask me all the time about like, how, how does somebody start in comedy, this, that, and the other thing? I'm like, you just figure it out. There is really no blueprint. You're either kind of meant to be in this crazy world or you're not. And you're going to figure that out relatively quickly, maybe, if you're a self-aware person. There's a tremendous amount of sacrifice you have to put into getting good at it. And you probably have to be a little crazy. You probably have to be a little off-center to truly want to get involved in this, right? So already it's very tough to then write a blueprint for somebody because there's so many variables. And there. so when I see Gary and people like that just pollute, because his, his whole theory of everything is just pollute. Pollute the world with content. Post four times a day. It doesn't really matter what you're saying. Ideas are shit, execution. And to me, that type of stuff's ruining the world. The idea of we just pollute, pollute, pollute with no thought behind it a lot of the worst trends in our world start, I think, with people that have no idea what they're doing, just doing. And then I think that just sets up a huge, because then we're like, yeah, everything's great. We don't need politicians to have any clue. Like, if we're all just doing and throwing it out there, content is king, boom, boom. You know, marketing is queen. That's another thing he says. And it's just like, but what is the actual thing that we are marketing? What is the thing that we're doing what is the that? Where is the actual value other than this perceived value? And that's my big problem is like, you'll see certain people, you know, certain restaurants are so hyped up. They're everywhere. They have a dish that's all on Instagram. Everybody, they're hard to get in and you get there and you eat the food and you go, eh. So what the hell was the point of it? Now, obviously the people that run the restaurant are making a lot of money, but you, the consumer that go in there and go, the food's actually not that good. And we just got taken for a little bit of a ride. To me, I mean, I guess the value is that you got taken for a ride. Maybe you won't get taken next time. But to me, I'm like, a lot of people that I know that are entrepreneurs, they have a nature. Their nature is that they're entrepreneurs from when they were young. Gary Vaynerchuk's one of them. So this right, idea- With, with, with uh, uh, you know, he, he, he kind of states he was born with nothing. And right. I, I guess he came from Russia and Ukraine, moved to think, yeah, yeah. And, and um, then his parents started a wine store and he right. kind of, I don't want to say inherited that wine store, but worked there and really built and he that up. he modernized it online. I'm, yeah. Again, it's not really, I'm sure he doesn't like me if he knows who I am, which I think he does. But it's not about him per se. It's an entire dimension of the internet. And specifically that business guru self-help can be like, I love sales trainers, guys like Dale Carnegie, Zig Ziglar, because they're telling you how to sell. They're literally saying, when you sit down with somebody, look them in the eye, ask for the order, da 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 They're giving you kind of the step-by-step -step thing about a specific process, a sales process that you can kind of apply to a bunch of different things. I'm not against the idea of motivational people. I think Tony Robbins has some valuable stuff, but there's something very hollow about the specific strain of motivation that guys like Ty Lopez and Gary Vaynerchuk do, where they're literally walking around a $10 million mansion and they go, and if you want to know how to get this, click here. It's like, no, that's not it. I already know that that's not it. I already know that by clicking there, that's I'm not winning. I'm not getting the mansion by clicking there. I, I, I feel that instinctually in my heart. Oh, oh my God. So one time I was in California and... You know, everybody who's working for Ty Lopez, a lot of them are like his relatives. What does he do? <laughs> what do these people do? Right. I, I'm like a man. Yeah. All right. I'll describe. Because uh, so Ty Lopez's cousin or sister or whatever says, hey, you should, if you're in L.A., stop on by. So, of course, I'm not going to pass up that opportunity. I stop on by Ty Lopez's mansion and 
you know, and it was kind of like living in this insane world. Like everything was wrong about the interaction. So he tells me to show up at, at three or his cousin says, show up at three. Ty will be ready then. And he, he, they put me in a room and he's not ready till three 30. Then every seven minutes, he had to do some different activity. That was some rule of his. So for seven minutes, he would get a massage. For seven minutes, he was getting a haircut. For seven minutes, he ate lunch. And then there was one point, somebody literally ran up to him and, and like gave him a brand new pair of sneakers and he put those sneakers on. Then he says, walk with me to the gym. He does like stretching for seven minutes. And seven minutes, you shouldn't breathe. You know? Be <laughs> nice. That could be. And then, and then later that night, I had to go to this event. It was like, this charity event, Elton John was was singing, and it was there was a fairly high price for this event. At the end of the event, around one in the morning, everybody's leaving. Ty Lopez is coming in. He's in a tuxedo. He's coming in. Didn't have to pay anything because he's coming. The event's over, so he's walking right. in. He's got his um, selfie stick, and he's like, "Oh, here I am with my good friend James Altucher," and like he's as if he had you know he's in the tuxedo as if he was like yeah. at the event the whole time, and. Uh, uh, but it's the same thing with a lot of these guys. They create this vision of this this world, this imaginary world, you know, like the mansion he rents. You know, you go to, he, you know, he has this one ad where it's like you got to read books. You go to where the books are. It's all like these, you know, fake, like it's like this statue of books, like right. carved into his. So everything right. is kind of like a mirage. Yeah. And then and then but he's selling this this dream and. People young people in particular buy into it. And then since Ty Lopez has no actual expertise himself, and I'm just, you know, I don't know, maybe he does, but then he'll team up with some real estate investor. And he's like, here's my good friend who does real estate investing. You could buy this course for $6,000 and you, your very first deal, you're going to make $300,000. And he'll simply split the profits of that with that real estate guy. So he'll do that all day long. Like, team up with people who are selling these courses. But his first thing is, hey, you should live a life like me. Here's my 67 steps to living the life like me. You'll get it for free. People sign up. So he has 100,000 people sign up for his email list. Now he's got 100,000 people who love him and they're all young people who maybe are a little more gullible. Then he's selling these $6,000 courses or $3,000 courses. People will, these young people will buy them and he splits the price and he makes like 50, 60 million a year on that. Like, so he, wow. he went from good for him. <laughs> hey, I never get mad at them. Good for him. Well, and listen, I love a huckster. I love a con. I call him out because it's funny and I have to. But keep hitting him over the head. Keep whacking him over the head. Well, I love it. He, he good. Went, but the weird thing is he went from like he there's someone's got to take these people's money. <laughs> it's got someone's got to take their money. Someone's got to tell these people that after their three thousand dollar real estate seminar, they, too, will own a house in a you know. <laughs> the Hollywood Hills or whatever. I, I, it's just great. Good for them. So, so Gary's model, cause I asked why I, I've known Gary for a long time and I've asked why Is he a I'm, fun guy. He doesn't seem fun. Uh, I mean, it's a very, it, all these people, a hundred percent, they're very odd to interact with. Like I once even pitched a TV show gurus gone wild. Cause I knew, I know all these people. And I was like, uh, when you look into their, when you peek into their inner lives, it's a lot different than what their- Guru's for, gone wild? Yeah. <laughs> Please tell me I can find this somewhere. I want to make it, but no one- Oh, uh, I thought you, I thought it was a thing that we could find. No, no, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta write it up. Guru's gone wild. So, uh, but like Gary, he's not selling courses like Ty Lopez, but he is selling the same vision. Like if you, if you hustle and grind and, and execute- I no problem with gurus. Just tell me a real thing. Okay, here's the real like thing. Like your, your your expertise is, and I could be wrong here, but like Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, things like that, right? Yeah, but it. but I I've been I've been I've written over twenty books. Right. I've been. But you're giving I've, people like information. Yeah, I use my yeah. first, my first business just to the one minute background. My first business in the '90s before every company had a website. I built the websites for AmericanExpress.com. Uh, Bad Boy Records, yeah, dude, Death Row I Records. I watched 45 minute Gary V talks where he says nothing. 45 minutes. I don't know what I should do, what he's doing. I mean, we're talking an hour. Right. I genuinely don't, other than post on TikTok. Right. I don't know what to do. I, I, he goes, social media is your friend. I'm like, I know. Kindness is delicious. Gary, what do we do? Like, I want to know. So, I, I'd so, like to go on his podcast and maybe I'm wrong. I'll 
I'm willing to be wrong. I just I haven't found anything that's so. So let's. Uh, so I asked why, like his company has 800 people employees, from what I understand. And I've run and my first business was an ad agency building websites. And with 800 people, you're going to go out of business pretty quickly. You can't support right. 800 people in a service business because once there's even a tiny tick down, you're out of business. Right. And so so there's a why there. Like, OK, he's supported by various billionaires, from what I understand, who who invest in his business and, and keep it going. But then what's it good for? Well, these billionaires own valuable consumer brands that we know of every single day. And because Gary Vee has so captivated the Gen Z audience with this vision of if you just hustle and grind and 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 execute, you're going to be rich. And the Gen Z people love him. He gets millions of followers on every platform. They 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 literally they love what he's saying, uh, even though it might not mean it, he's selling this dream. So so brands then hire him and billionaires who own these brands support his business and keep it alive because now they have this direct voice to hit the Gen Z audience. It's the same technique as Trump. Trump dominates Twitter. So he doesn't need any news company to support him. He broadcasts to 50 million people on Twitter. Gary broadcasts to every Gen Z person on TikTok or Twitter or Instagram. So if you're selling like the latest fashion brand, you pay Gary a bunch of money or you invest in his company to keep it going. And now you have this direct voice to Gen Z because of because Gary has this message, whether it's correct or vapid or incorrect or whatever. He has this direct voice now to Gen Z. And that's yeah. his model. Well, God love him. I, You know, again, I don't begrudge anyone there the way they make my I just I have to call out things that are funny and they're they're fun. It's funny. It's funny to have somebody all day tell you to hustle or grind. It's just funny. It's especially funny when there is no mental health care in the country, and that's all you get. Yeah. All you get is a guy on Instagram telling you to hustle. Well, that's well, funny to me that that's where the world is at. One time I took it's a bunch. Kooky. One time I took a bunch of his photos where he's giving all these inspirational quotes, yeah. but every photo has him just looking at his phone in different positions. He's like right. sitting looking at his phone. He's on a bus looking at his phone. He's on a train looking at his phone. And I I what if they took a phone away from that guy for like an hour? What would he do? Would he bite someone? Would he kill somebody? I don't think he would know what to what, say or yeah. what to do. And I put it I put it up on my Instagram, this nine by nine grid of him looking at a phone. And like I say, Gary, what are you looking at? And that's the last time he ever spoke to me. Interesting. <laughs> so I think he told I, I don't know. You Seems never know, so right? Sensitive. Yeah. You don't yeah. you never know. Maybe he's just busy, but usually we would have some back and forth. Right, and right. uh that was that. Interesting. But uh Interesting. but but there but that's again like everything on the surface has some narrative. So right. and you never hear what the actual narrative is. I had to dig to figure out how's he how is he in business? I had to right. dig to figure out who how does he instantly get millions of followers on every platform? Like it's right. strange stuff happening. And then also because he has this Gen Z audience, companies will come up to him and Uber will come up to him and say, Hey, can you be an advisor? We'll give you a quarter of a percent of the company. And he collects those uh little advisory percentages yeah. as well. And you can make a ton of money that way. Right. God love him. Yeah. God bless. So so it, it it is interesting the idea, you know. No one will say the actual under there's a there's the mountaintop and then no one will say the entire narrative that's underneath the mountaintop. Yeah. Like take MK Ultra, which you've talked about a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of created modern society. Right. If you think about it. Like it created the whole hippie culture of the sixties because yeah. the government was giving acid to every John in San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, MK is very interesting because it's, again, it's, it's these things that people just really don't know about. But it's definitely true, it's but it's always labeled true. a conspiracy. It's always labeled a conspiracy. Uh, you know, it was a government basically trying to figure out how to control people's minds through uh, psychedelic drugs, through certain tests, through, um, you know, uh, depending on who you talk to, through uh, very traumatic events that they either put people through or took people from those traumatic events and saw... You know, so the the reality is you you have a, a, a you know, during the Cold War, you had the, the Russians and us basically trying to create super soldiers. We're experimenting with the idea of what would it take to create somebody who was, uh, you know, we could split their mind up so that they were the super spy that they, you know, wouldn't be able to confess any information because they genuinely didn't know it because that was in one part of their brain they couldn't access, you know, it was one personality and the other person. And you know, what about a Manchurian candidate where you could essentially just have somebody be the president or be a senator, but literally be secretly controlled by, you know, the group of people who would devise this, you know, behavioral technology or technique. 
their success level with that is, you know, debatable. There are some people that believe that they were very successful at it and they were able to use it on people like Sirhan Sirhan, who, who uh, assassinated Bobby Kennedy and that it still works to, to this day. There are some people that will tell you that they were never they were never able to do it. They were never able to hijack somebody's mind 100%. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. Uh, there are some very interesting things that people point to as examples of MK Ultra working. Sirhan Sirhan's an example of that. Where you look at it, you go, hey, this, this is a guy behaving very oddly. And, you know, I don't know. You have a guy that assassinated or tried to kill Reagan, quote unquote, because he, you know, supposedly loved Jodie Foster. And then you look at this guy, John Hinckley Jr. The Hinckley family and the Bush family were actually friends. Neil Bush was having dinner with the Hinckley family the day or was scheduled to have dinner with them the day that one of their sons shot the president, which would make who the president? Neil Bush's father. Again. If it happened in Russia, we'd all go, see, Putin, conspiracy, <laughs> happens in America, we all just kind of ignore it. Very interesting to me. That's just a string of fun coincidences. Again, to me, it's a coincidence if like you're on a train and somebody next to you grew up in your town. That's a coincidence. <laughs> the idea that of three, you know, of however many million people were in the country at that time, not as many as we have now, but a lot, the idea that the guy that tried to assassinate the president, his family was having dinner with the 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 vice president's and that's, son, because I didn't, I didn't hear that fact, huh. fact you can go look it up. Huh. Having dinner with the pre the vice president's son, the guy who stood to inherit the job if Reagan was killed, that is an interesting coincidence. Just a fun coincidence that is one hundred percent fact. Huh. You can look it up. It's Washington Post, New York Times, real deal. And why did he uh, uh try to assassinate Reagan? Supposedly because he loved Jodie Foster. Which is a narrative. That's the narrative. So, I mean, again, do you know? I mean, I, what do I know? I just look at all these things and go, ah, this seems odd. Because as a comedian, I think my job is to go, oh, this seems odd. That's the, the base level of my job is to go, ah, oh, you know, there's a frozen yogurt place on every corner and yet people think it's healthy. That seems odd. And I write a dumb bit about that. Or, hey, the, the president's assassin, his brother was going to have dinner with the vice president. Ah, that seems odd. Okay, but does it seem odd that they would schedule a dinner, almost like a celebratory dinner, the day a family member is? I find it odd they know each other. Uh -huh. I yeah. find it odd that they even know each other on a, on a level where they could be friends to that degree. Of all the people in the world that tried to assassinate the president, the idea that their families are close and tight. Again, it's, does it necessarily mean something on you know i don't know but it it makes you look it, in a country that was a mature country that was being dealt with honestly by the press that would have been a bigger story and i think people would have started going wait a minute we want a little we want answers on this more than just jfk same thing we want answers on this yeah by the way you took a photo of yourself at the x which, by the way, is very weird, yeah. as you pointed out, that in Dallas, there's an X right at the spot where yes. John F. Kennedy was shot. Yes. A week earlier, uh, my wife, Robin, and I, we were in Dallas and did an Instagram video right at the X. And there's a guy, I don't know if you met this guy, there's a guy standing right there, at least he was then, yeah. um, where he kind of describes, and he has a, he's selling a DVD, here's where the shots came from. Here's, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald was actually on the second floor eating lunch. And yeah. his, his, he was eating with his <clears throat> boss and, and he wasn't on the seventh floor or the sixth floor or whatever. And the, no shots even came from the school board de depository, yeah, school book depository. Uh, yeah, school book de depository. So so I, I sort of feel like that was clearly a conspiracy or some kind of cover up. But for whatever reason, nobody wanted to investigate it. Well, Nobody wants to investigate anything. I mean, and that's a reality. People don't want to investigate it. The Boston Marathon bombing is very odd. You had. Two guys that the FBI said, we have no idea who they are. Then Russian intelligence came out and said, yeah, you do. We told you who they were. And then the FBI is like, okay, we did know who they were. And then it comes out that the FBI had some prior relationship with them, even though they've kind of denied this. And then they had to kind of walk back their denial. And it was probably a case of like the FBI recruiting them as informants. And then maybe something had happened because the FBI does this all the time. This is how the FBI, you know, you know, you know, does a lot of their work is uh, through the use of confidential informants. This is what they do. You know, they entrap people. Entrapment is what the FBI does. This is 
they send a guy into a mosque with a bomb and he, they try to get three other people to agree to go bomb somewhere. And then they go, you're all in jail. This is what the FBI does. You know, there's 50, there's uh, FBI agents right now in an office in Virginia pretending to be 15 year olds on the dark web in trapping substitute math teachers that are pedophiles. I mean, it, this is just what they do. So, right. I don't know if you remember, uh, well, it was before you were born, but in 1980, there were, or 1970, there was the whole ab scam thing. Yeah. Where the FBI pretended to be yeah. sheiks yes. bribing all these politicians. Of course. Total entrapment. Yeah. Whitey Bulger, they they have informants. This is what they do. And a lot of times they let those informants go out and do bad things as long as they keep informing. So the Boston Marathon bombing happened and the FBI was like, we don't know who these guys are. And then Russian intelligence was like, we told you exactly who they were. And then you're like, these guys were traveling back and forth to like, uh, I forget the name of the, it's, it's Dagestan, but where is that? That's in... That's in Chechnya or it's the, yeah. And it's like the, the caucuses and shit like these hotbed for terrorist activity, hotbed. And they're coming back and forth to America, you know, and, and it's okay and it's fine. And then eventually this horrible bombing happens and people start asking questions and it's very weird. And they shut down the whole city of Boston. They catch these two guys in a boat. They, they are trying to kill both of them. Clearly they end up killing one of them. And then the trial is really not covered. And then they put, SAM, special administrative measures on the attorneys. Not only the, the Dokar Zarnayev, but also the attorneys can't speak. The attorneys can't go and be interviewed about this whole thing. And then the reason they give for that is, well, national security. Uh, we don't want to inspire other terrorist acts. But they were very clear that these two acted alone. So it's like, well, if they acted alone and they're not part of a larger network, then why would an attorney being interviewed about the case? So there's clearly something they don't want getting out. I mean, this is just a weird situation you know it's just odd and nobody really because people think you're like insulting people's memory by asking questions it's like no i'm just very curious about and here's here's the other thing and this is verifiable fact the zarnaya family tamerlan Zokar, their grandfather rusli zarnayev you're gonna love this because this is just fun and it's factual rusli zarnayev Who's their uncle? He's not their grandfather. He's their uncle. Because I'll make this point and somebody will be like, it's actually their uncle. As if they've done anything. It's like, it's the same, you know. Their uncle, Rusli Zarnayev, married Samantha Fuller. Samantha Fuller is a daughter of Graham Fuller. Graham Fuller was a career, not only CIA agent, but the architect of our like Mideast policy for the CIA. Big CIA guy. Big CIA guy's daughter marries Rusli Zarnayev his grandchildren or his nephews become the first terrorist attack on our soil since 9-11? Interesting. Very weird. Shadowy labyrinth of connections there. I don't know what that means. I can't tell you what it means. I know that that's a fact. And I know that that's very interesting for me. And it's an odd coincidence that this guy married into a CIA family and his nephews end up having some type of relationship with the FBI that the FBI doesn't come out about. And then they end up doing this horrible thing in Boston. It's weird. And a mind like mine, it's hard to shut those things off. Well, but I think that's the solution. Like you say, yeah. like this scares you at night, all of these things. I think the solution is doing what you do, which is asking why, talking about it. And you're able to say, hey, I'm just a comedian. And that kind of like, you know, passes yeah. the, passes over the newspapers and, and all these people right. who try to deny or, or refute. Like, hey, I'm just a comedian. I'm just saying this this thing looks interesting and it's funny. Right. And um, which is what John Stewart would always say. Right. So John Stewart really was the only actual news source in the country. Yeah, very and funny. and if everyone if anyone ever called him on it, he said, oh, no, no, I'm not news. I'm just a comedian. But he was actually the only news source. Everyone yeah. even said this is yeah. my news source. Yeah. And I think now I, I think there was this wave where Everyone was reading, like, let's say a decade ago, there was all these popular self-help books. And then you have, for the past three to five years, all of these popular intellectuals uh, that kind of did the podcast, uh, you know, scene. And then now I think, though, the real voices are comedians like yourself, like some others who are you're seeing them. Your, your podcast, I imagine, has been yeah. shooting up in downloads for the Go, past two years because yeah, yeah, yeah. now this is the voice. It's the only voice. The only voices people can trust because you're you're asking the why and there's no rules about what conditions you can put on it. So you can connect the dots any way you want. And then it's up to people to decide whether to trust it or not. 
Right. And I mean, that's the thing. I mean, what I do is entertainment, but there is some info there. Everything, I'm not lying about every, everything I'm saying. You could Google it. You could verify it. You could check it out. So it checks out. Um, the conclusions you draw are your own, you know? And I, I, I wrestle with them. I, I, I have different conclusions every night about yeah. it. I'm like, what does this mean? What is, you know? Yeah, and I, I mean, we probably, just like you, I hear stories every day, whether it's, you know, a podcast guest who off to the side tells me he used to be in the CIA and this, this, this happened, or... Uh, the other day I was at, uh, um, I was talking to this very big hedge fund manager and he was stumped about something. And so a hedge fund manager manages billions yeah. of dollars or whatever. And, and they play in a very big league in, on, on wall street and he was stumped and he couldn't figure it out. Like he, he would say on a Friday, maybe Trump would tweet, Oh, trade uh, negotiations with China, not going so well. And so for the last hour, the market would collapse. And then s Sunday morning at three in the morning, he would tell me, this guy was telling me, uh, somebody from somewhere would start buying uh, in the overnight markets an enormous amount of what's called futures. So basically the stock market they were buying. And at three in the morning. And then at four in the morning, someone from the Trump administration would come out and tweet, oh no, uh, Trump was wrong. Trade negotiations are going great. And so then the market would shoot up. Right. So who was collecting who was buying all this market, uh, stock market futures in the from, middle. from three to four in the morning on a Sunday night when in there's the usually no activity? Yeah, who's, who is doing that? Yeah, and it's not illegal because it's, you can't, it's not illegal right. to bet on a tweet. Like it's not like inside information about a stock or anything. Right. It's just something weird. And he, and he, he, this guy was telling me, this seems to happen at random points at least once a week. And there's someone buying oddly right before the tweet. And some, he said someone is pulling billions a week out of the market. And it could it be someone related to Trump? Could it be somebody else? Like, but, but that's just like one small, tiny thing I hear about at a dinner party. There's all this stuff happening underneath. And the only thing you could do is you can't figure it out and you can't stop it. You could just be raise the question, ask the why. That's it. You can just ask why. Just get on the boat. And, that, and, and that's... Take the ride. Yeah. Because yeah. what can you do about that as a citizen? You can say, okay, things are unfair. We need to redistribute wealth or whatever, sure, which, yeah. which might be fine. But then you look at like Elizabeth Warren, which, okay, do a 2% tax for people worth over 50 million. But by the way, don't you think people worth over 10 million are also wealthy? Why can't they pay the wealth tax? It's also like, don't you think people that are that wealthy, they know about tax exempt securities and all that stuff. Oh, I mean, yeah. I'm all for taxing rich people. I'm all for that. Um, I just, you know, my whole thing is where's the money going? Is it for more war, you know, it, or is it actually to help people? And because we, we always talk about, oh, tax are rich, but it, it, it doesn't seem to make it into the hands of the people who need it. Yeah. Like you're going to give it to the post office oh, yeah, and, and giving, 18 year old soldiers in Afghanistan. Yeah, we've been giving, we, we've, we've, we've taxed a lot of people. We've taken a lot of money. Uh, very little of it has made it into the hands of people who need it. Yeah. And I like how the reality is nobody ever wants to pay more taxes. Right. So Elizabeth Warren, maybe it's a good idea that wealth tax, why put it at 50 million? Why not put it at 10? That sounds like pretty rich people to 99.9999% of the country. Well, she's worth 12 million. So right. let's put it at 50 million. Because right. again, we're doing not for being, a, for being a professor, which I think, I think the next yeah. thing is going to be college is going to burst. Absolutely. The bubble of college and the fake bullshit, like the student loans, the people take out so that they can, Go get a degree in the you know gender theory of cats is going to have to go away, right? And like I argue this with my kids, I say, "Why are you going?" And so the education reason is out the window because yeah. that's been disproved. There's no educational benefit. Oh, but like to learn how to socialize. Okay, you're going to socialize with the same suburban demographic you just spent the first 18 years of your life with. You're just going to spend another four years partying with these exact same people while yeah. either the government or your parents pays the bill. And then you're stuck in debt and you can't get a job. So true. Scary. Where are, are your kids away, going away to school? Yeah, so our kids, we have five, 17, 17, 19, 20, and 20. Um, one's finishing school this year. One, fortunately, listened to my advice, dropped out. <laughs> Uh, one and two are applying right now, and one's in a, a different kind of school. Do they all live here with you, or there? No, different, okay. different, different places. Oh, well, uh, great! Three or four of them at any given point live with us. Okay, fun. Do they all get along? Yeah, I that's think so. Good. What do you think, Robin? They all get along. Yeah, that's great. <laughs>
Yeah. That's great. Yeah, we were, we've just been married a year, so we've been blending them uh, blending for this past them. year. Oh, perfect, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's and awesome. It, yeah. How many are yours? How many are hers? Two are mine, three are hers. Oh, awesome. And yeah. everybody's cool. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. They'll all be here this week. That's great. So, and uh, and you're in L.A. now. I'm in L.A. every month. Yeah, I mean, I'm in L.A. pretty much. Like, I won't be back February and January, February. I'm going, and then I'll be back March to Headline Carolines, which is awesome. I'm excited about that, mid-March. Uh, but I'll be I'll be in L.A. for the next two months. Yeah, you know, I work a lot on the East Coast. You know, I'm an East Coast act in terms of, like, I get booked and bought. My biggest markets are D.C. and Philly and Boston, and I do very well in Florida, and it's like I sell very well in Chicago and stuff. I end up being on the East Coast a lot because that's where I do the weekends. So every now and then I'll take a few days in New York. But I do love L.A. and all my friends are out there and Rogan's been amazing and that whole crew of guys, Burke Kreischer and Theo Vaughn and Tony Hinchcliffe, that whole group of people I really like. And I love the comedy store and David Spade's been great. I do that that show out there with him. Oh, yeah. You do yeah. That, uh, the PR yeah, notes for David PR Spade. Thing, yeah. That's great. So I, I love L.A. and I, I I've always said like, I always thought I was going to be a New York guy and I was going to be that New York guy. And it just went another way. And I ended up in L.A. and I ended up really liking it. So. And you said earlier, it's hard to predict five years ahead. But where do you see ha, ha, like come like right now, there's probably more working comedians in the country than ever before. Like it's been almost like a, a fad. And I don't think it affects you, but there's so many people like vying for you know, the 52 Netflix specials that will happen that this year. I think what's happened is there was um, people tell me, they're like, we're in the transitional phase. I'm like, the transition happened years ago. You know, what is a comedian? What's considered a comedian right now is very different than what was considered a comedian even three, four years ago. Um, you know, it is a broad definition that includes people online, people on the internet, people that are on social media, people that are vlogging, people that are YouTube stars, people that, and, and any and all of those people can do live events, whether they choose to do stand up or a podcast or meet and greet, they can fill seats. You are now competing with everybody that's interesting or entertaining throughout all of the media landscape. That is fucking terrifying. For a lot of people, I love stand up. It's my first love. I'll do it all the time. But if you're just doing stand up comedy right now, you're a blacksmith and you have to be, you know, conscious of the fact that the fans you're going to get are, are going to find you on their phones. They're not going to find you at, at a comedy club, no matter how prestigious it is. And hopefully those people follow you into comedy clubs and then follow you into theaters. But you're not doing yourself any favors by not being on social media or not trying to, not only not being, you gotta be funny on social media. You have to figure out a way, that's part of your job is to find out how to be, you might hate it, part of your job is to find out how to be funny on Twitter, funny on Instagram, maybe funny on TikTok, certainly funny on YouTube. That's part of your job description now. It wasn't, you know, it was maybe five years ago if you were really ahead of the game, but certainly it wasn't 10 years ago, um, but it, it is now and it's non-negotiable. You know, I think that, so that's the, so where it goes five years from now, who knows? But I, I do know that you're going to see the people that have figured it out and are figuring it out. I think their careers will flourish or blossom to a degree. You, I, I, Maybe the era of superstardom is over, the idea of the massive arenas, and that, that can still happen. But I think you're going to have your people, they're going to come out to see you. You're going to find a way to monetize that. They're going to enjoy what you say. There's going to be a lot of voices and there's going to be small groups of people that enjoy those voices as opposed to this top down, you know, gatekeeper enforced sphere of people. And then there's just this rigid hierarchy and you can only kind of move up with when. But I mean, I, I could be wrong. You know, these big streaming services, they could come in and colonize the internet. They probably will. And, you know, it might go back to a more traditional trajectory in the new media landscape. You can already see it happening on YouTube and in certain places that, you know, the cartels are involved, you know, the big companies are involved, the entertainment companies are involved. They might carve the space out and, you know, you may go back to like gatekeepers may start being reintroduced. I mean, they're still around. Tech is still in its own way a gatekeeper. We're all kind of slaves to the algorithm. Yeah. But that is... 
the future. So if you're a comedian right now and you're you're not spending a few minutes, you know, really ideally an hour a day looking at your not to use Gary's word, but your socials, you you really have to you really have to dedicate yourself to that because you know the the nature of the job is kind of changed. You still have to be funny, but you know, no one cares about the New York Times writing a review about your your set. It's you know, it's no one cares. But they because they can't, they're not gonna show their friend the New York Times review. Maybe an old couple cares that lives in Beacon, New York, and they're like, oh, isn't this nice? But the majority of people are showing people a funny video you made or a funny stand-up clip, or they're sending somebody your podcast, go listen to this. And if you don't have those things, how are people finding out about you? It's just not yeah. happening. So so it's funny. This is going to be like a little bit the Gary Vee podcast. Yeah. But his book, Crushing It, which I think he wrote in, um, I want to say 2010 or 2009. Yeah. I wrote the forward to Crushing It. I'm <laughs> kidding. I, I That'd be awesome. But uh, uh, that is that was for me, like his best book, because that's what you're doing. Like every day you post on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, you know, you probably think about your podcast. Uh, yeah. Crushing it is basically being on all the platforms, responding to some of the comments. And that's what he means by it. And it, yeah. that works. It does work. I do think that you have to do it. But I also think that it's, it, it's the part of the reason is because I kind of know what I want to do and who, who I am and what I think. So I think if you do that and you're just not a person yet, I mean, you can probably still have some success at it, but I think that like you got to be, and that's my only issue with him is like, I totally get the crushing it, but it's like, you got to be a thing. Right. Like, and I, and I think that's the, the thing is like, you got to interface with the world from a certain position. And, and to me as a comedian, you got like, what is your funny? Who is your audience? Where are you, tr like, what is, you know, what is the the impetus for why people should follow you? Somebody said very early on, they said, if you don't make it, what who loses out? If no one comes to the show, That's what are they quote. losing out on? I love that quote. Who and said it, that? Someone who didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> and they were probably <laughs> quoting someone who did. But it was said to me in a Long Island diner by someone who said, yeah, what are people losing out on if you don't pop? Or if that they, is the yeah. most amazing quote I've heard in a while. Because so it's true. That's what I like when I do my sketches or my video or anything like that. I'm trying to give people a more realistic version of a Saturday Night Live. Like, let me give them something that looks a little bit more like the world that we live in as opposed to the world as we would want it to be. Right, because you, 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 again... If you said if you don't, if you just do stand up, you're like a blacksmith in today's world, and you do, you can see on Instagram or YouTube, yeah. you do these sketches, sk sketches yeah. that are just so funny. Like yeah. you know, you're the 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 guard for Epstein, yeah, or your yeah. Megan McCain is like a big one, right? Or or you know, all these things are just are just brilliant. And I I agree, you have to be more than one thing and kind of combine them, and that's and it's this fun. unique Here's intersection. The other thing, we have a lot of fun making those sketches. We have a lot of fun doing that. I have a lot of fun doing the podcast. I don't think it has to be drudgery yeah. and misery. And I think sometimes stand-ups get this idea that everything's got to be painful. We grow through pain. Some of that's true. But a lot of it, you have to sit back and go. Like, the transition of my career came from going to L.A. It came from, I went, I auditioned the comedy store. I did not get passed. I had an okay set. It was fine. I don't, do, I don't, I don't like, uh, uh, blame her for not passing me. She could have, but she didn't, and that's fine. I, I I'm totally cool with that. I like I like people that work there. I love the manager, Liz. I, I I I have only positive things to say about that play. I love Noam, the owner. It was on me that I just didn't have the. Uh, I, I'm like not always a great guy in three minutes. You know what I mean? Comedy wise, I went to L.A. and I was like, oh, you know, that was crushing. And I went to L.A. and I was sitting in my friend's garage. And there was no spots in L.A. I wasn't in at the store. I just got there two years ago. And I didn't even live there yet. I was just coming out back and forth. And I was sitting in my friend's garage. I think we were, and I don't even smoke. We were like smoking a cigarette. I was very depressed. And we were in his garage. And he said, I have this desk and I have this camera. And I have this green screen. And why don't you just sit at this desk and like 
just rant and go off. And Roseanne had just been canceled. This was, you know, 2018, 17, 18. Roseanne had just been canceled. So I just went on this rant about how I'll do Roseanne. I'll be Roseanne. I was like, what is, what is, what is Roseanne? She's fat and she has dinner. I'll be Roseanne. I'll be racist and have dinner. Give me the money. I'll be Roseanne. And it was just this really funny thing. And we put this old school 1990s backdrop of, uh, you know, of the Twin Towers behind me, like a New York backdrop, like, mm. you know. And we did it and we just put it out as a goof. And people were like, oh, this is funny. This is kind of ridiculous. This is funny and ridiculous. And we just kept doing them and kept doing them, kept doing them. And they got started to get a little bit of attention. They started to get a little bit of attention. And then when the Megan one came, I just threw a wig on and I said, I'm Megan McCain. We edited the video. My friend's computer, you want to talk about the way things work and how odd things are? The computer he was editing it on broke. So he forgot the order he edited. He had it edited on. And then he drove 20 minutes to another friend's house to do it on a MacBook and just was like, I just forget how I even edited this. And he's like, oh, I guess it'll just go this way because these are the lines that just are the most ridiculous and make me laugh. He cut it together. And it, you know, it's viewed millions of times and people love it. Megan McCain hates me or whatever, but I mean, lighten up. You have nine houses, calm down. But the whole thing is like, that all came from being in a garage and not knowing what was next and thinking I had done a Comedy Central special. I had done a 15 minute quarter hour on Netflix. I wasn't really selling any tickets. I'm wondering what the hell's going on. I'd done the JFL New Faces comedy. You know, I'd done all those things. None of them worked. I tried to get into the cellar. I didn't get into the cellar. And unfortunately, I'm in, in, in LA, in a garage with my friend. It's 3 a.m. I just performed, I think, in like a, a coffee house parking lot, literally, on a milk crate. And I'm like, I'm in comedy eight years. I'm fucked. What am I going to do? And then I was just like, oh, fuck. But I'm funny. But that's the thing. It's like, oh, but this isn't a con or a hustle or, a, you know, this is I'm actually funny. So. I'm in a garage with a desk and a camera and a phone. We shot it on a phone. Let me just be funny in the environment that I'm in. And then that led me to the bigger podcast and to the bigger clubs. And then people started buying tickets and it led me back to the world's. And then it led me to getting past at the comedy store. And it's like, so I took this circuitous route to the places I wanted to be all along. But I think, do you think, I think now you always have to take a securitist road, yes. like everybody. Yes. Because who's going to, who do you know that just did the normal route and is now going to be sell out arenas? There are certain people that I think are very, very, that are like Seinfeldian, like Mark Norman, for example, who's like a Seinfeldian comedian in the sense that like he is a brilliant, um, what it was, oh, prolific, smart, sharp, tactician who's great and and just can put out stuff over and over again i don't know like listen where anyone ends up who ends up in an arena i don't even know but i i, I look at somebody like mark and it's like i can understand mark just doing stand-up and that's not to denigrate him at all that's actually to exalt him and say he's a rare breed of human being that is just so suited for that specific type of stand-up that being said there's very few of those guys and gals that can go out there and do that. I think most people, and even Mark would say marketing wise now, he's also going to take a different route because we need to, you need to get people's attention. Yeah. And he's got a podcast with Joe list. Yeah. And- but I mean, I just love being crazy. So to me to put on a wig or to do something stupid and get attention and by being very funny in the environment I'm in is just to me. Great. And then I love stand up, and then to bring it all back to a stage is also great. And your, your humor doesn't feel Particularly for these sketches, it doesn't feel scripted at all. Like it's maybe not. you do multiple it's all takes, but and then we edit. So that's why my editor, this guy Ben, that I met in LA, he, me, and him think comedically in a very similar way. I go, he'll give me lines sometimes, but I go and he edits. Editing is so huge. That's what a guy like me's always not really been able to do, because I just put it out there as like this whirling dervish, and he's able to go, okay, let's try to find the through line here. Let's try to find what's funny. Let's try to punch it up. And and I feel like although you're trying to be funny, like that's more of a skill than hey, let me go into funny mode. It seems like again you have something, you, you know, it's Wrong almost with me. yeah, yeah, that's something funny people. But 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 that but that's just it. It's like it's like 
every artist, every writer, every uh, comedian, there's something damaged inside and you kind of have to find yeah. that place yes. and let it sort of come from that 100%. guttural place. Yes. Cause like when you're talking at office parties, you're not just sort of observing from afar. This is what an office party is like. It's like, you hated your existence. It felt like when you were in an office party, I was and then you exaggerate. Back to that, I do this stream of consciousness on my pockets, but I was taking myself back to literally standing in a bar on Long Island, uh, bar restaurant on Long Island, knowing I shouldn't be there, and what that felt like, and th that applies to anyone that's ever been somewhere where you know you shouldn't be. But that doesn't mean that all of you shouldn't be. That doesn't mean that there aren't parts of you that can make it work. But it was just standing in a place where I knew this is a stop on my journey. It's not the end of my journey and I shouldn't be there. And I think that like that was where I that episode was really funny because it allowed me to kind of just beam myself back to be that guy and the absurdity of the people and me interacting with them. Not and it's not it's not a neg on them. It's not a neg. It's just me not being there. It's the same thing if I was at the New York City Ballet and we're all in the back, and we're all talking and they're like, what is this? And it would be the absurdity of me being somewhere I shouldn't be or I don't belong. And I, I would say working at the New York City Bell. I guess if I was just there, it would be okay. I just saw the Nutcracker. It's great. But oh, be just getting tickets. Yeah, I love I love it. I see it. Yeah. I, I, I saw it like 10 years ago. I love it. I think the Christmas show is trash and the people who see that should be killed. But I like the Nutcracker because it's very wealthy, well-dressed families from Scarsdale, which is where I kind of want to spend my time. <laughs> Uh, and not Rangers jerseys and like cheese. It's like, ugh. but so, so I think that a lot of it is like, um, can you remember? And I, I put myself back in the spot and, and that's where just, it, it, it was really funny because like, I was just like, oh fuck, I live this. Yeah. And, but then you take it like that extra absurdist level yeah. where it's just yeah. like you're in the brains of all these people and what their goals in life are yes. and, and projecting like what they want and how they're justifying not getting it. Well that, yeah. And that's the comedic angle of like, yeah, it's a comedic angle for I mean, you. My family gets mad. You know, I have to see my, I should talk my family a lot. I have to see them. Boomer Christmas. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have to see these people and they're like, we don't talk like that. I'm like, yes, you do. I mean, those are lines my father has said. I love my father, but these are lines he has said. He's literally said to me and my friends when we tell him about like one of our other friends who's like, dad, my dad's like, you got to golf. You got to make time to golf. He goes, the older I get, the more I regret. Just because even just play nine, just play nine. Take a half day. I mean, it's just like these are lines from not only my dad, but, my, but he, you know, the boomers that I grew up with in Long Island, my friend's parents who would talk about buying condos for all of dinner. Like we want to go to Naples and it kind of. So and I love these people. I grew up with them. It's not that I dislike them. It's like you make fun of the things you know and love and care about, you know. And that's kind of what people don't understand. Bill Hicks used to shit on the South, but he's from the South. He knew the South. A lot of it frustrated him, you know. A lot of people. Sebastian Maniscalco makes fun of the people he grew up with and the, and the, their mentality and everything. But he loves them. I mean, so it's like I, as much as the they, they're just ripe for parody. The boomer right. generation is ripe for parody. I think that's a key because if you're just angry at who you're talking about, it's going to come across as vindictive. The, of course. The, the audience is an x-ray machine. They're going to say, oh, he's just angry. Well, yeah. you're like with the office party one, you're really just, it's almost like you were t turning the anger on yourself. Like you knew you were yeah. off to be it's bigger not things. It's their fault I'm where I right. shouldn't be. None of it's their fault. And I think that's part of the thing you have to realize is that a lot of it is you. But it's just very funny to look out at places in your life you've been that maybe you shouldn't have been and, and, and figure out like, how am I going to extricate myself from those places? And well, it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting for me because like, so I've been writing for writing books for 20 years. So the first, let's say eight or nine years, I was writing about finance and just wrote finance books and yes. wrote for the wall street journal, whatever. And then I started writing, um, more like everybody assumes everyone on CNBC is like, rich and successful and whatever. Right. But during this 10 year period, I had made and my listeners know this, but I'll do it quickly. I, I had made millions several times and lost all of it down to zero, at least five times. So like from 15 million to zero from then from 3 million to zero, then from 7 million to zero. And I had done this repeatedly. Like, like I was like wow, the worst circus idiot in the world. Yeah. And so instead of just writing some finance book, suddenly I started writing, look, this is what really happened. And 
it felt so real to me. This was for me, my career transition. And no one, now it's almost like a genre in business self-help, but no one was writing this at all. So I would get calls from people like, did you have a stroke? Are you about to kill yourself? Like, is something wrong? Because, and my rule was, I couldn't publish a piece of writing unless I was afraid of what people would think. That was rule number one. Like, right. unless I was afraid what people would think, I couldn't publish because then I'm writing the same thing everyone else is writing. I'm just in that zone, right. that comfort zone of what everyone else is writing. But if I go out of it saying like, look, I went broke. You don't have to listen to me anymore. But this is then what happened after that. And this is all the shitty things that happened when I was going broke. And this is what actually happens to your friends and your family right. while you're going broke. And so suddenly my audience 10 x and it changed everything for me. And, and, and at the same, but my one, but another rule I had was I'm only, I should only hurt myself. I can't hurt or blame anyone else. Right. And, and cause it is really only about me. And that said, though, I still lost friends, family, coworkers, opportunities. You know, it's just, you're, you're op you have to be, you have to be okay with your whole life changing once you make that sort of honest transition. Yeah. And that's okay. I think that's good. Change yeah. is good. Yeah. Change is good. Look, look, for you, you went out to California. You you stopped doing, you know, the clubs in New York. I think there's a yeah. certain safety factor. Like, you yeah. you know, a club owner wants people who are interesting, but also doesn't want the audience to give bad reviews and so on. So it maybe is a... a, a I think New York just, it's, it's just, there's a flurry of activity. Hmm. New California, you have to create that. There is not that. New York, you can do spots all the time. You can be around things that are happening. There's just this inertia that feels like it's moving you forward, whether it is or it isn't. In California, you truly have to create that. That starts with relationships more than it does in New York. Because California, people make the time to see each other. You don't bump into each other. It's far less casual there. So when you're working, you know, if you drive and if you and your buddy each drive a half hour to meet somewhere, you're going to make that time more valuable than if you're just walking down a street, you would anyway. Um, and when I met my friend Ben and we started doing all these things, it was like, this is a relationship that is very vital to my career because this is the first relationship I've had where the person in it is not a stand-up comedian, but they're, they have a comic sensibility. They like editing and they want to make things. And I want to make things too. And we put our heads together. We just started to, you know, really make things. And I feel like too much about New York is about going it alone and it's bad and it's not the move going it alone. It's me against the world and I'm on the subway alone and I'm in the rain and I'm miserable and I'm cold and I'm the one on stage for five minutes and I'm killing and this, that, and the other thing. But it's like, Nobody's an island, and I think you need to find people that have the skills you don't, and I need you need to collaborate. You need to learn how to collaborate. You need to learn how to make things. You need to learn how to you know, develop uh, different things, and, and too much in New York is about going it alone, and in L.A., it's, it's not that that isn't possible. You can go it, uh, alone in L.A., but even just carpooling, the idea of like people are like, all right, you drive today. I'll drive tomorrow. It, it just lends itself to, you know, meeting people and and trying to figure something out with them. Well, you look at like any artistic movement, like look at the beat movement in the 50s, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, William S. Burroughs, and a few other people, but mainly those three, they all hung out together at Columbia. They kind of yeah. grew up as a scene together. They did completely different things, you know, but Allen Ginsberg would fly to Morocco and edit William S. Burroughs' Naked Lunch. Allen, right. you know, they would help, you know, everyone rejected on the road, but, you know, they helped... Jack Kerouac get on the road published. So it's sort of like, a, you know, in, in, in the art world, the same thing has happened. I think you can't, I think you're right. You can't succeed going it alone. You have to kind of find not your tribe. I hate that. That's like almost like a self help word, but like you're seen somehow that you're going to grow up with. And I feel like you have it to some extent. Like I, I put you, Andrew Schultz, Chris DiStefano, Giannis yeah. Pappas, you kind of like all in this group of people who are using social media podcasts and everything yeah. to, to sell tickets just as much as your reputation from stand up. Yes. Yes. You know, like you said, you were on comedy central to do a half hour Netflix. You did a quarter hour. Your podcast is probably viewed much more than those much more. things. Much more, much more. And it's better. And the reason it's better is because it's not a 15 minute. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just better. It's more, if you want to get to know me and if you wanted to become a fan of me, 
I would much rather give you hours of content of raw, unfiltered me than I would give you a 15 minute edited, you know, scripted. They're jokes I'd worked on. And so from to go from one to the other, to me, it's like, it just so much, so much of today's climate feels like it lends itself more to like the authentic. I think that's what attracts people to key. people, right? Is authenticity. Too much of comedy is a veneer where people aren't the people they are pretending to be or their their comedy's a magic trick. And you kind of get the idea now that, oh, if this guy wasn't telling those jokes, he'd be like miserable and I don't want to hang out with him. And he actually wouldn't say anything interesting. So I don't I don't want that person. Well, and it's also a lot of I don't I don't want to I don't and I don't know anything. So I'm just broadly generalizing. There's there's some notion where some comedians are pandering to the audience because likability is considered a strong factor in stand up comedy. But I like how you also I see this with Andrew or with Chris Stefano, yeah. um, where you're able to take a strong frame with the audience. You're able to tell the audience to shut up or you're able to yeah. say. But that's because they like us. I will be honest with you. That is because they love us. That's because we are likable. If we weren't likable, we couldn't do that. Yeah, like in the WeWork, the one, the, the, the yeah. set you have pinned yeah. to your yeah. Twitter, that WeWork, you're like, you know, you're a bunch, just a bunch. And they like <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, they love it. Because they need, listen, it, it, we're in a world where Jimmy Fallon plays at Muppets and Ellen DeGeneres dances with people. It's like, it's not the real world. None of this is real. Seth Meyers is goofing around. Like, you know, like Henry Kissinger, Miss Piggy, and Jimmy <laughs> Fallon are playing footsie. None of this is real. And people know that. They go, What's going on? Because there's that world, and then there's a world of like school shooting, opioid crisis, Detroit's fall, like all of these things that are happening that aren't reflected in any meaningful way in pop culture. And you know, so that when somebody just fucking goes off and calls it out or say, like, people are like, oh yeah, okay, that's. Well, that's, how long did it take you though before you were able to go years from and years and years? What, what you thought was comedy to. You know years. what? I care about the opioid crisis, so I'm going to take that well, on stage. That, like I can't. Well, I do care. I don't want anybody to die of opioid. Okay. I'm a sober guy, but it's also like it's not even that I'm up there trying to make a point. I'm just calling out what this is. Like I look at the world, I look at the news, and then it goes into Fallon, and I go, "What the fuck?" Because the news is just Trump impeachment. Uh, Russia, North Korea, opioid, school shooting. And then you go to Fallon and he's playing uh, checkers with Cameron Diaz. And that's the bit. The bit is that he goes to the, uh, uh, we him and Post Malone go to Red Robin or something. Uh. I mean, that's the comedy bit. And I go, oh, this is an infantilized idea of what the world is. And I don't know who's the audience for this. Fat Housewives in Galveston, Texas, who just sit there we and eat pills and drink while their husband polishes his gun in their car. I don't know, but I don't understand who is enjoying this and who this is for. I guess it's for people that don't want to uh, like open their eyes at all to anything ever. I don't get it. I don't even think it's funny. So, right. So, so you would take these things that are, were obvious to you. Then what was the evolution? And this, I, I promise we'll, we'll close this down soon. What, what was the evolution to uh, to turn that into something funny on stage? Because that's not so easy to take a viewpoint. I think the evolution was the first time I did something like that was I was at the Grizzly Pair, which used to have open mics. And there was a Monday open mic that was really, really great. And I think I got there late. I was working in Staten Island. I was telemarketing. I was selling photocopiers over the phone. And was, was that taking, the Comedy Mob open mic? Uh, I, I used to do Comedy Mob. No, over it, was, it was it was something called Kinnison's Wake. And it was I, everyone who's, a lot of people have done it. But Stefano used to do it. Like, But then also people, I don't know where they are now. I got up and I just started ranting and raving about how much I hated my job and my life and how the Staten Island Ferry was the worst place in the whole city. And so was Staten Island, and you had, to, and I know that because the you know the boat to get there was free, and I just started going off on this toxic kind of just get, and it was just doing really well, and it was just hitting with people because it wasn't like tightly scripted jokes; it was just kind of this idea of like everything sucks, and here's why. And from there, I just started going, oh, that's kind of what people want from me is raw, and obviously raw in a in a in a, in a sense where it's it's organized because they want you to be funny and consistent, but they want that raw, like, this is fucked and here's why. Did, did, where did you, did you have a sense like I need to insert the funny in here or did you just have this confidence that, okay, 
I'm going to be raw and I well, know it it'll be funny. Well, it just started killing immediately. Mm-hmm. So it just started murdering immediately because it was just a, a connection with everything I was saying was real to me. It was authentic to me. So even if somebody else didn't feel like that, it was funny because the funniest things to me are when I, I, I it's real to that person. And you, that yeah. person's bringing you into their life with what they say. Even if you're like, I don't even, that doesn't make sense or I don't agree with that. Or, you know, why was my office party rant funny? It was funny to people that had never gone to a Christmas party. That had never, I, I've, I have messages from people that go, I've never, I've never worked in anything like it. And I don't know why I left. I don't know why I identified with that. I've never even been to anything. I've never even been to Long Island. I'm from New Mexico. I don't, I work at a zoo. I had a guy from like, hey, I work at like some type of zoo, ecological preserve thing. And New Mexico goes, I've never been to Long Island. He goes, why did your Long Island stories crack me up so much? I said, it's real to me. It's authentic to me. And that makes you laugh at it because you know I'm on the level and you know that somewhere, somewhere out there, these people exist. These stories are real and you're having this collective experience with it and it makes you maybe think of your stories and your people and your fucking life. And and that's yeah. what I think it is. So if it's real and authentic, I love it. And that's the comedy to me. And sometimes, and this is going to sound crazy, comedians are inauthentic, but that's who they are. And I love that because I'm like, oh, you're not a real person and you shouldn't pretend to be. You're a sociopath who's collected thoughts and ideas and you have no experiences and you just you sleep in a pod every night waiting to just, and that's fine. Be that. Just it's to me, it's like the authenticity of if it's real to me and funny and crazy, it's going to make somebody laugh. All right. Well, Tim Dillon, the uh, host of the Tim Dillon podcast, such yes, a great Tim podcast Dillon show. Thank you. Tim Dillon show. Thank you for uh, coming. Uh, 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 <laughs> thank this you is for to my apartment. <laughs> you can keep it. We'll leave. Uh, uh, you all the two episodes on Joe Rogan. It's only two episodes on Joe, right? Two yeah, so 12, far. 50, 13, 90. Something yeah. Like that. Yeah. They're both great. Yeah. They, <laughs> they are both great. Catch your stand up. I'm looking forward to your Carolines in, in March, but you're oh, all thank up and you down. So much. Tim J. Dillon, D I L L O N on Instagram and Twitter. Get my socials up so that me, Gary can know who I am and we can, we I can almost wrote Gary and told patch. him to come over here today. But does he live here? Yeah, he lives. He lives in New Jersey, but he hangs out in New York. Interesting. So after this, and I actually, I, I, I don't think he knows who I am. I think he does. Maybe I would wonder. I, I kind of made fun of him a little bit on Joe. That's the only like clip that doesn't have a ton of views on YouTube, and like YouTube doesn't monetize or whatever. So it's kind of interesting. You're like, okay, he's got some power. But again, <laughs> I think I think a tour. Is in the future for us, where Gary trains me to be. Let's do it. I something. Can, I, 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 I want to get involved. Guru's gone up. wild. I'll host. <laughs> I'll host the show. I'll, I'll, I'll get it. I'll make it happen if I can. I'll, I'll make yeah. the attempt. Yeah. So, well, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Will you come on again. Come I'll, on again. Uh, anytime. Excellent. Great. Thank thanks, you. Tim.